time. Personally, I think it's a rather slippery slope to talk about restricting a particular demographic's right to vote because they show a marginal preference for the political party that you don't like. For all the talk about women's, you know, 10-point preference for the Democrats, you don't hear much about the fact that Obama captured 95% of the black vote, 99% if you take Gallup's exit poll data. Do you think we should take away the right for black people to vote as well? Honestly, I think if your prerogative is to start restricting the right to vote for any person or group whose political ideals don't perfectly align with yours, you may as well just give up any pretense of democracy at all. You know, yeah, democracy is awesome, but only as long as my party gets to win. But that's kind of an aside to the main issue being explored here. I think a side-by-side -side comparison between feminism and the black civil rights movement tells us an awful lot, not just about the power of those individual movements, but about the nature of political power itself, particularly the power of identity politics. A few people in the comment section for my biology culture ideology video brought up the fact that the black civil rights movement seems to run counter to my theoretical model of human society. Unlike the biological preference that both men and women share towards female interests, race is actually much more exclusionary. In fact, far from the outgroup preference that men show for women, race seems to be the exact opposite, with some studies showing that group and community cohesion all but disappears as racial diversity increases. In other words, if biology precedes culture and ideology, but the white politicians in power didn't have an innate biological preference to help black people, then how did they achieve a politically successful black civil rights movement? Surely the black civil rights movement is an example of an ideology surpassing the underlying limitations of biology. On its face, it's quite a compelling argument until you actually look at the timeline of events. The Tender Years Doctrine was signed into UK law in 1840, 78 years before women over 30 got the vote in 1918, and 88 years before universal suffrage where the vote was extended to UK women over the age of 21, comparable to UK men. In the US, the duration is much the same. Although there was no explicit federal policy signed into law like the UK, legal precedence for default maternal custody goes back as far as 1830 to Helms versus Franciscus, with the judge opining that, quote, The father is the rightful legal guardian of all his infant children, and in general, no court can take from him the custody and control of them thrown upon him by law, not for his gratification, but on account of his duties, and place them against his will in the hands of even his wife. Yet, even a court of common law will not go so far as to hold nature in contempt, and snatch helpless pulling infancy from the bosom of an affectionate mother, and place it in the coarse hands of the father. The mother is the softest and safest nurse of infancy, and with her it will be left, in opposition to the general right of the father. End quote. This legal precedent prioritising female interests being set 90 years before the 19th Amendment granting American women the right to vote in 1920. Now, whilst these women were enjoying their piece of the political pie absent the vote, it was a very different story for black Americans. Despite gaining the right to vote from the 15th Amendment in 1870, well before women, black Americans continued to live for another 90 years under segregation and Jim Crow. The black civil rights movement, and in the general sense black political enfranchisement, didn't really reach a critical mass until almost a century later, when second wave feminism was happening at the same time during the 1960s. I really don't think that is a coincidence, and I think the answer is written directly into the wording of the legislation itself. Almost precisely one year after the Equal Pay Act of 1963, 
barring wage discrimination on the basis of sex, we get Lyndon B. Johnson's Civil Rights Act of 1964, reading, quote, It shall be an unlawful employment practice for an employment agency to fail or refuse to refer for employment or otherwise discriminate against any individual because of his race, colour, religion, sex or national origin or to classify or refer for employment any individual on the basis of his race, colour, religion, sex, or national origin. Race, colour, sex, race, colour, sex, race, colour, sex, you get the point. Despite abolition and obtaining suffrage as early as 1870, many a black man still found himself swinging at the end of a rope based on nothing more than the say-so of a white woman. After almost a century of segregation and Jim Crow, the black civil rights movement wasn't given any real political consideration until the 1960s, when the political interests of those aforementioned black men began to nominally overlap with the political interests of those same white women. As an aside, even within their own movement, It's interesting that the catalyst for the black civil rights push of the late 50s was a black woman being told to move to the back of the bus. I wonder if the movement would have gained the same traction if rather than Rosa Parks, it was Ronald Parks refusing to be ordered around. As we all know, society views an argumentative, disobedient man very differently to an argumentative, disobedient woman. An angry man is seen as an inherently dangerous animal, and that, unfortunately, would probably go double for a black man stuck in Jim Crow America. Ronald Parks, had he existed, would have probably just been dragged off the bus, beaten within an inch of his life, and nobody would have batted an eyelash. But I digress. The Titanic sank in 1912, close to a decade before female suffrage was bestowed on its largely British and American passengers. This page tallying the death toll laments that the numbers make it all too clear that the rule of first class first outweighed the principles of women and children first. Mm, Not really, my blue pill friend. When we actually look at the numbers by class, the only non-male category that first-class men surpass is third-class children, by a mere percentage point, and the only class category where the survival rate for children was higher than their adult female counterparts was the second class. Almost across the board, women came out on top, with an overall survival rate for women on the vessel being one and a half times the survival rate of children. There is some truth to the author's statement that the principle of women and children first is inaccurate. It should really be amended to women first, children second, men last. Women are, to put it bluntly, the most protected class in society, regardless of their voting status. Meanwhile, back in America, despite already having the right to vote, Black men were not even allowed to drink from the same water fountains as white men. Women lacked suffrage, but they were enfranchised nonetheless. Inversely, black men had suffrage, but still lacked any kind of real social, legal or political enfranchisement. And looking at this timeline, we can all but pinpoint the exact moment these two identitarian political movements converged. Now, I'm not saying that the two movements, feminism and black civil rights, were best bosom buddies. In fact, there was apparently some tension between them. But despite that, they did have more or less overlapping goals. They were essentially lobbying, albeit separately, for the same political outcome. And the result was a shared victory. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, addressing discrimination on the basis of race, colour, sex. As a sexually dimorphic re 